Everybody, it is great to be back with you again this evening. Hopefully my voice doesn't crack. I'm getting over a slight cold, so uh, bear with me if it does. Do you need a water? Oh, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for appreciating that. I was just thinking I should have brought that. <laughs> oh, that is much appreciated. Um, Hey, it's getting to be my favorite time of year, you know, coming up the mountain on I-40 and seeing the leaves start to change colors already. Doesn't get much prettier than that, you know, and that's um, one of my to God we serve. He blesses us with things like that that he didn't have to, you know, and we get to, we get to see his glory in so many different ways. We're going to be in 1 John again tonight, chapter 4. We're still making our way through 1 John. And if you recall last week, we covered chapter 4, verse 4, and we talked about how <coughs> our confidence comes only from clinging to Christ. And it's a confidence that's unshakable, and it's the only kind of confidence that no one can take away from us. And you know, confidence in ourselves, like we talked about, or confidence in anything else will never be enough, no matter how hard we try to trust in something else besides Jesus Christ, it will always fail us. Our works will fail us. Other people will fail us. But Christ will not. And instead of wondering, how much should I do? Or have I done enough? We can find rest in the one who said it is finished. And through that, we're confident that we've overcome the world. And we're in this state of already but not yet, meaning we've already been redeemed and justified before God. And we've already been sealed for eternity in Jesus Christ, and nothing can change that. But we've not yet fully realized what eternity in his kingdom is going to look like. We haven't grasped that yet. We haven't reached that point yet. We have to endure some battles in this life until we get to that point. But we know that our God has already won the war. And in this time, we have to deal with, you know, we still have to deal with the side effects of sin and the results of sin. We have to deal with our own sin. We have to deal with all kinds of evil in this world. But we know in eternity, we will no longer have to endure any of that. And I encourage you not to lose sight of that. God's word encourages us to realize God is greater than anything in the world. And we've overcome the world through him. And through that, because of that, we can be calm in the most chaotic times. You know, we talk about how the most trained athletes, the most trained fighters, or most trained um, combat men and women are the most confident and the most calm in chaos because they trust in the way they've been trained. And as believers in Christ, we have his word, we have his Holy Spirit, and he's living in us, and we are greater than anything that is in the world. And we can have that same confidence, that same calm in a very chaotic world. And because of that, we can boldly go out and proclaim the gospel. No matter how chaotic it gets, we can go out into this world and continue to tell people who Jesus is. So last week we looked at the confidence in our message. <coughs> Tonight we're going to look at the motive of the message in verses 5 and 6. Now, a motive is a very valuable thing. When you're investigating a crime, <clears throat> it says a lot about the validity of somebody's statements. You want to look at the motive behind a statement that someone makes when you're investigating some sort of crime. And obviously, I've done that a lot. I've been in law enforcement for 11 years. And you always have to ask, you know, one, if you're interviewing a suspect, why would this particular person want to do commit this crime? What would make them want to do this? Is it for personal reasons? You know, somebody they may know very well that they may be angry at, they're trying to get back at, and maybe grudges they hold against somebody, there may be some sort of selfish gain that they may be motivated to commit this crime. And when you're interviewing witnesses, that's where it gets really valuable. Because you can't always establish a perfect motive for a suspect, for the witness, you know, you can ask, why would they have a reason to lie? You can ask them, you know, do they know the suspect or the victim? Does 
that lead to some sort of bias that makes them want to tell a statement a certain way? Do they have anything to gain by telling a lie? And there is so much power in a, in a case and so much weight can be carried on it in a case with an independent, unbiased witness because they are solely making a statement just because they want the truth to be known and they want people to be safe. That's a very powerful witness. And as a witness for Christ, we are to be independent and unbiased by this world. From, we're to be independent from any desire for worldly gain. We're to be unbiased by any desire for that. We want to make the truth of the gospel known and see people saved by it. Glorifying our God and seeing the church built up. That's our sole desire for telling the truth of the gospel. And all of that is part of the kingdom work, being independent and unbiased by the world. And as John shows us in verses 5 and 6 tonight, our teachers, our, our faithful teachers, godly teachers, are known for the same motives. False ones lie, and they have reasons to lie. So as we read, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 again, just to get in context of the whole passage again, because um, we've been working through this same passage about three weeks now. And, but we're going to focus in on verses 5 and 6. So starting in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is something, or that is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's pray. Lord God, as always, we are so grateful that we can come together and worship you as a body of believers. Lord, I thank you for your word as we dive into it. I pray that, Lord, you would speak to our hearts that you would empower me by your Holy Spirit to speak on your behalf and not my own, and that we would learn more and more of the truth of the treasure of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> so the first thing I want us to see here is he says in verse 5, they are from the world. The they he's speaking about there are false prophets and false teachers that John was having to combat in the first century. On behalf of these churches. He sent this letter around to the seven churches, as I've said many times, to combat false teaching that was circulating throughout these churches. And these, these false teachers, as John said in verse 1, they've already gone out into the world. They're everywhere right now, and they're a real threat. And as verse 3 has already taught us, a false teacher, by the standard of God's word, is anyone who does not confess Jesus as the incarnate God in human flesh and doesn't confess Jesus according to what scripture says about him. The word confess in Greek is homologeo, and it means to say the same thing. That's what confess means in the original Greek language. So someone who confesses Jesus is someone who says the same thing about Jesus and believes the same thing about Jesus that the scripture says. They don't add to it. They don't take away from it. They stick to what the scripture says. And we don't ever compromise on the truth of Jesus. We don't ever compromise on the truth of Scripture. There is no room to compromise there. We don't compromise on what's called our Christology, which is our knowledge of Christ. And we only draw it from what's in Scripture. Now, there's going to be many secondary issues that we may disagree over as different churches from different denominations. You know, there's many, many secondary issues. And some of the most popular ones are 
you know, continuationism with spiritual gifts versus cessationism, or how frequently we partake in the Lord's Supper. There's, you know, many different secondary issues like that, but as long as the church is adhering to what the scripture says about Jesus and the foundation of the gospel and not compromising on the authority and the truth of God's word, then they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We have to remember that. So I'm not talking about secondary issues. I'm talking about people who would actually compromise on who Jesus is. Those people are false teachers and liars. <clears throat> and anyone who does this, we're not to have fellowship with. They are from the world, it says. Anyone who does this is to be exposed and spoken against by God's word. They're to be measured against the standard of God's word and exposed and spoken against. Because they are hostile towards God. Anything that is of the world, like John is speaking of here, is a system of hostility and animosity towards God. Anything from the world is an enemy of God. And the world, like John is talking about here, is what we're commanded not to love, if you recall back in chapter 2, verse 15. It says, do not love the world or the things of the world. That's the one do not love that we see in Scripture. We do not love the world. We do not love the system that is against God. And these false teachers may be very deceptive. They may act like Christians. They may appear as Christians. Only to some extent, but on the surface, they may be very deceptive. That's why Jesus called them a wolf in sheep's clothing in Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to flip over there for a second. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 23 reads, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. <clears throat> so Jesus predicted the coming of false teachers from the get-go, and he warned his disciples of the dangers of false teachers. To call somebody a ravenous wolf is to realize they are a massive, deceptive threat. Because I don't know when the last time you saw a ravenous wolf, but it's not anything to toy with. And they may, these false teachers may do great signs and wonders and miracles that make them seem like they are from God. But they do that to deceive many because they're giving people what they want. This says the Pharisees demanded signs from Jesus. They wanted him to keep doing miracles. They said, you know, that's, that's not what I've come for. That's not the main thing I've come for. I'm doing the miracle to show you I'm from God, but I'm really pointing you to the kingdom of God. But many people in this world just want the miracles for the sake of the miracles. And that's where the Pharisees and Sadducees and other Jews were wrong. They wanted the miracles. They didn't want the eternal God. And these same teachers today are the same way. They don't know Jesus, and he doesn't know them. He said, depart from me. I never knew you. Their lives don't bear the fruit of Christ. And they're more worldly than we are. Their fruit that they bear is worldly. And they may seem successful, but only by worldly standards. They may be very famous. They may be very popular. They may have massive congregations. They may have a megachurch, so-called. So they may be wealthy. They also may be very, very proud and arrogant and full of themselves. And they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. That's the next thing I want to see here as he goes on to say. This is why they act worldly, because it's still their nature. 
or they may put on a show to seem like something different, they are still part of the world. And they tell the world what they want to hear. That's why they're so popular. That's why false teachers get such a following because they're all on the same page. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, Paul warns Timothy as he's teaching, he says, there will be many in the future who will leave sound doctrine to have their ears tickled. Let's paraphrase, but many people will depart from faithful teaching just to hear what they want to hear. <clears throat> That's human nature. That's the nature of people who are still of the world. And they will find teachers in accordance with their own desires. And those from the world don't want to hear godly teaching. 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul says that the natural man rejects the things of God. The people of the world choose what they want. It's like an a la carte menu to them. They pick what they want to hear. Worldly teachers are speaking worldly things to cater to the world and to draw worldly people in. And they may be they may be worship services and sermons that are, seem very spiritual by emotional experiences. They may just be very motivational and self-help oriented. There may be a certain one who tells you how to live your best life now, which, disclaimer to that, if this is your best life now, that means you're headed for hell. Our best life is yet to come. That is what the scripture tells us. Or they may teach things that are in line with a very works-based salvation, like legalism or moralism, where it's treated as just a, Christianity is treated as just a set of rules by what they teach, just a set of do's and do nots. Now, following Jesus means it's already been done. Not do this and don't do that. Jesus has paid it all if you follow him. This message that these worldly false teachers present is tailored to the desires of the world and will always find a following in the world, but their teaching will not lead to life. It's headed for destruction. And they'll preach a message about how to be wealthier and to say God wants you to have more money, or they'll preach a message that makes people feel good, but they don't lead to life at all. They don't lead to eternal life. The first century false teachers that, that John was combating that what really mattered was this higher knowledge of God that was very mystical. And they said sin doesn't matter. You know, the consequences of sin don't exist. Well, who in the world wouldn't want to hear that? You know, that drew a big crowd because they figured it was a free-for-all. That I'm sure that drew a very large crowd, but it was extremely deceptive. Again, that's why they're called wolves in sheep clothing. You know. Live it up. Do what feels good. That's what they're, they were being taught. But they were being led straight to hell. And people that teach that kind of message will get a lot of money and a lot of followers and a lot of popularity and success by worldly standards. Another aspect of first century false teaching is what Paul had to write against in the book of Galatians. There, the church in Galatia had, that you know, there was a a strong body of believers there that was following Christ, but there was a bunch of what he called Judaizers that were coming in and trying to get them to come back and follow the Old Testament Mosaic law and say that's what was required for salvation. And it was a very works-based idea. And Paul had to combat that as well. And if you look through the letters of the New Testament from Paul, John, and Peter, almost every kind of false teaching is combated in God's word. We have to know our scripture to know exactly what kind of false teaching we may be dealing with today because it's the same thing, just in a different form. It's the same tactics, just in a different form. Whether it's a, some sort of mystical, spiritual experience that people are after or some sort of legalistic lifestyle that people are after. They, none of them lead to life. And they all fail the test that John has already laid out that we've studied. Throughout the book of 1 John, <clears throat> he laid out two standards for true followers of Christ. The first one is pursuing holiness. And these false teachers are governed by greed, their own flesh, and they have no true heart for God. Whereas a true believer lives set apart from the world and pursues righteousness in every way possible. 
And then they also fail the test of love. Many of these false teachers are extremely rich while their followers are in great poverty all around the world. And there's been several times where it's our wealthiest you know, preachers that you see on television today that seem to be super popular and are ridiculously wealthy. When a tragedy strikes in their community, they don't extend a hand to help anybody out. They want to keep their own money for themselves. That's happened so many times, it can't be counted. Their followers are headed for hell and they know it. They're leading the blind straight to hell and they don't care. They are instruments of Satan. And we do not evaluate success of any ministry by worldly standards, because a lot of them will be very successful by worldly standards. We don't evaluate them by worldly standards such as cultural relevance, the size of a church. And, I, and I'm going to say on a side note here, that clearly doesn't matter because, you know, while Woodcliffe may not be the biggest church in the world, it's full of faithful believers that I've had a great pleasure to meet here. Mm -hmm. And that, the size of a church does not matter. It's the hearts for God. And it's the love for one another. That matters. We don't judge a church success by its income because, again, many of the most ravenous wolves are the wealthiest. We don't judge it by worldly approval. We have to ask whoever is preaching, whoever is teaching, whatever body of believers we're looking at, whose approval are they living for? Are they living for an audience of men or are they living for an audience of one? One God. So what defines success by our means? Bringing glory to God, knowing Him, making Him known, and enjoying Him forever. That is godly success. That's what we were made for. And John is saying here, those are the motives that we live by. We are the faithful teachers. Examine our motives, because we are from God. That's what he goes on to say in verse 6. We are from God. He's talking about himself and the other apostles here. They were the foundation of the church, and they clearly did not live by the standards of worldly success. They endured persecution. They endured being put in jail, beaten, martyred for their faith. They lived in poverty, all for the glory of God. Paul who was a very well-esteemed Jew, said he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a legal expert and very well-regarded in Jerusalem, laid aside every worldly approval he had for the sake of the gospel. And if that doesn't show the truth of the gospel, I don't know what does. Because he was the one who was persecuting the church and getting all the worldly approval he could handle. And in an instant, he met Jesus and began being the one who was preaching the gospel and endured much persecution for it. The motive authenticates the truth. What reason would the apostles have to lie? What reason would someone preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ today have to lie? False teachers will lie because it brings them fame, fortune, and it gives them control over people. Because they assume some sort of role of authority figure in these people's lives and say, well, you know, if you deny me, you're denying God. And you don't want to do that. So they, they manipulate people. But the apostles, the faithful teachers of our day, <clears throat> would they lie to willingly endure what they all endured? The people who are still today being persecuted for their faith all around the world, would they do all that for the sake of a lie? Would the apostles all have gone to their death for something they knew wasn't true? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 16 through 33, Paul talks about the authenticity of his message. He says, Again, I say, let no one think me foolish, but if you do, receive me even as foolish, so that I also may boast a little. What I am saying is, I'm not in this confidence of boasting, since many boast according to the flesh, I will boast also. For you tolerate if anyone enslaves you, anyone devours you, anyone takes advantage of you, anyone exalts himself, anyone hates you in the face. 
To my shame, I must say that we have been weak by comparison. But in whatever respect anyone else is bold, I speak in foolishness. I am just as bold myself. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I am more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure of me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. Paul endured everything. Paul was humiliated for the sake of the gospel. What reason would he have to do that if it weren't true? That's how we know the authenticity of the godly teacher. They endure with motives as pure as possible. To know God through Christ, to make him known, and to bring glory to him and enjoy him forever. And for that, they renounced all worldly credit for Christ's sake. And they adhere to John's test of love and righteousness. They seek to bring God all the glory, and they do everything that they do. They preach the gospel out of love because they don't want to see anyone lost or go to hell. That's the mark of a true follower of Christ and a true teacher of God's word. <clears throat> he goes on to say, he who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. So who's the audience? That's another thing we have to look at when examining a, a teacher to know if they're true or not. Who's the audience? Godly teaching and preaching produces a godly congregation. That's the fruit of godly teaching. Worldly teaching produces a worldly congregation that looks just like the world, just maybe a little more dressed up. God's people love God's word. That's what they want to hear. They don't need anything else. God's word for us is our nourishment, our daily bread. And it is foolishness to those who are perishing. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. The people in the world that are perishing, they don't want to hear God's word. They want to be entertained. The children of God hear the voice of their father, and the sheep know their shepherd's voice. And the Holy Spirit is in us and gives us this power of discernment that we can have confidence in. And we cling to the voice of our Heavenly Father all the days of our lives. We love His word. We hunger for his word. We don't deviate from it to the right or the left. Because godly faith is a persevering and content one that desires his word. We don't need or want any innovation like the world does. God's word is always relevant to everything in our life. And it will never stop being relevant. John and the apostles preached the gospel everywhere they went. Faithfully lovingly and humbly. They didn't gain anything worldly from them. And those who came to faith in Christ belonged to Christ. And those who didn't were not, and they left it at that. Just like the parable of the seller on the seeds. They faithfully labeled, the seller faithfully labeled for the harvest, scattered the seeds, and left the growth in God's hand. He left the results up to the sovereignty of God. John MacArthur calls this the theology of sleep. Because when you plant seeds, when you plant crops, the growth occurs when you don't see it. The growth occurs while you're sleeping. In the same way when we share the gospel, the growth is up to God. God causes it. We don't see it. We may not see it immediately, but God will work in it, and he is in control. 
And let this encourage us to faithfully share the gospel with them. While we're talking about teachers, we are all called to share the gospel. We are all commanded to go and make disciples. We need to be constantly encouraged to share the gospel and realize God is in control. And he is sovereign over all people that he would bring to him. We're just, we just need to labor for his kingdom. And I have to humbly admit, this past Sunday, <clears throat> um, I had the honor of participating in an ordination council at um, my church. So um, if you recall Jacob Bigler that was preaching here before I, I filled in, I took over for him, him and his wife are about to move to St. Louis to pastor a church up there. So we ordained him at the church, or we're going to ordain him at the church this Sunday night. We had an ordination council this past Sunday where we had just all asked him questions about theology and scripture and, you know, just to kind of qual you know, to qualify him for going forth in the ministry. And our youth pastor is a good friend of mine. He just flat out asked him, when's the last time you personally shared the gospel with somebody? And I... I wasn't the one answering it, but I about felt sick because I'm a coward when it comes to sharing the gospel. And it's so easy to be. And I was deeply humbled by that. And I was heartbroken by that. The fact that if I were being asked that same question, I wouldn't be able to answer it. And we have to go forth and share the gospel. It's what we're called to do, and it's what brings the most glory to God in this life. And we think of so many reasons not to. Mostly fear. Fear of how people may react. Fear of what may happen. But just like the sower, we're called to faithfully plant seeds. And we leave the growth up to our sovereign God who's in control of all things. Now we'll look at the last part of this verse as a conclusion. It says, By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. <clears throat> John has given us another test here to detect true or false teaching. All throughout this passage, in verses 1 through 6, he's laid out a series of tests that we can look at to determine if it's true <coughs> from God or not. And first and foremost, like we talked about last week, we can realize we are from God and we have an unparalleled confidence in Christ. And that gives us the ability to detect false teachers and true teachers. And we cling to this, and his Holy Spirit will give you discernment. So that's the first thing to always remember. Next, examine what the teacher says about Christ. The standard that we measure them against is God's word. And we don't compromise on that. We don't compromise what the Bible says about Jesus at all. We don't add to it. We don't take away from it. And then, as we talked about tonight, examine the motives of the teaching. <laughs> Are their motives for glorifying God and seeing the lost souls saved, seeing the body of believers being built up and the word of God faithfully honored and proclaimed? If not, if those are not their motives, they are liars and from the world. But if those are their motives, they are followers of Christ and they are God's teachers. And then examine the motives and the fruit of the audience. And this is something that we need to be personally examining ourselves with. Do they or you come to hear, do you come to church to hear God's word or do you come to hear entertainment? You have to be constantly examining yourself. Do you want to come and hunger for God's word and draw nearer to God as a body of believers? Because that's the motive of a godly church. Do they, do this, you know, when you look at an audience, do they look like more like Christ or more like the world in their daily lives? Again, we must constantly examine ourselves in this way as well, as well as the audience of those that are hearing whatever particular teaching we're talking about. And remember those, stick to those, and trust in the confidence of the Holy Spirit to guide you in any teaching that you evaluate. Let's pray. God, we thank you that by your word, we can know what's from you and what's not. You have given us a clear revelation, a 
true that we can trust. Lord, your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it will pierce to the depths of any teacher that we come across in our daily lives. Lord, I pray for the protection and empowerment from your Holy Spirit for each believer in here. And Lord, I pray that we would go out with this confidence, armed with your word, faithfully proclaiming your gospel to everyone that we can to see lost souls saved and see a world transformed by the power of your life shining into the darkness. And I ask this in Jesus' holy name.